Hey everyone, so this is the behind the scenes for Camera Shutter Mix, the video that I released last week. It's going to cover the original video that gave me the idea for this, my own video, how I went about creating all the rhythms using all the cameras, the visual effects I was hoping to achieve, and lastly I'm going to showcase some of the cameras that I used. So, let's get to it. In the description below, or somewhere on the screen if you're on a computer, uh, there's going to be a link to a video called Nikon Symphony. It's created by a photographer, Benjamin Bong Wong, based in Canada, who was working with Nikon Professional Services. With access to about a dozen professional Nikon DSLRs, he and Andrew Kessler, a YouTube musician, uh, decided to create a 4 second clip of all the cameras going off, creating a sort of rhythm or beat with their show sounds. So I thought to myself, hey, this is really cool. I've got a bunch of cameras lying around. Maybe I can try creating something like it. So I dug up my small collection of film and digital cameras. I'll get into these later on. From the start, I knew that this was going to be harder to create because I was a one-man crew and most of my cameras couldn't shoot as fast. The only thing that really went all that fast was my Canon 60D, which wasn't even that fast, and I had to use it for the bulk of my shooting. I'm even using it right now to shoot this behind the scenes. At first, I started using Finale Notepad, which is a music um, score sheet composer program to create a percussive beat, a polyrhythm. As you can see here, I sort of give up on that. Instead, I took a more direct approach, which involved recording each of the camera's sound effects, uh, which took a very long time. I brought all those audio files into my computer, brought them into Audacity, which is a free sound editing software. What I did was, I added each of the sound effects from the cameras one by one in what I ultimately determined to be a chronological order. More specifically, I divided the cameras into two eras, one which is which I call the full analog era, which involves cameras that had no computer or processor in them, um, these old film, of course, and then a second era, which was all digital, meaning there was like a, 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 a processor or computer in there, and that's how I got this. Personally, I'm more of a fan of the analog film era sounds, that mix because the show sounds are so much more unique um, and not these fake beeps or buzzes or fake show sounds. From there I'd record a video in which I would, I would fire each of the cameras at the same instance that the show sound would play in the track they just mixed. And this got really tricky because some of the cameras would take a very long time to wind and loop fire after I pressed them. Since Von Wong's video was one fluid take I wanted to try matching as close as possible, but that was impossible of course since I was only one person. So instead I tried doing something which is called a cloning technique. Essentially what happens is I can crop the screen in a certain way so that in the background, the background stay put, but I'll add a frame or a section of the frame where something will happen from each take in the video and the camera would do the action during that one take. And in post-processing I would sort of just crop all the video so that it would only show this section of the screen, of the, of the frame, which would be that one camera, and the next camera, and then there'd be a total of six cameras going across the grid. For the most part, it worked, except that at the very end I realized I, I couldn't really tell where I was standing with the camera sometimes, so if, as you see in this clip, um, my arms would sort of connect, wouldn't show up properly. Um, originally, this was to just come out of the, out the edge of the frame. Instead, sometimes the, 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 the arms get cut off when cropping to create the cloaking effect. And so I gave up on that. I almost abandoned the project actually because of that. So instead I cheated and sort of cropped each camera frame with some black space in between them and had those appear with each introduction of their own beats. Which I guess sort of created a, a cool effect, I guess. Because you really get to see which camera, you get to, your, your ears and your eyes match up to see which camera it is that's producing the sound. And that was that. So if all you wanted to see was how I went about creating the video, the rhythm, the beats, the filming, that's all I really have for now, and so I guess I can stop watching. But if you want to hear more about all the cameras I used, feel free to watch on. The first one is the Voltlanders Comper Anastigma Scopar. It's a very old camera from the 1920s. Um, I bought it for about 20 bucks from Willie Hearts, which is a consignment or a group world shop in my hometown. And it's actually worth about a few hundred dollars online on eBay, now anyways. It uses what's called large format film. Essentially, the film is actually the size of this plate. Um, maybe 4x6 or 2 by, uh, yeah, it's super, 4x6 or 2x3. And the film for that is almost a fortune nowadays to use. So, I don't think I'll ever be shooting with this, but it's really cool to have because that's from the 1920s. This is literally the oldest thing that I own. 
and here's how it fires. There's a winding knob on top of here. You pull it back, and then this is the trigger on it, and you just fire it like that. This next one is the Kodak Brownie uh, Reflex 20. It's a brownie camera, which are very famous because when Kodak was in its heyday, it introduced brownie cameras. Cameras that were sort of the introduction of uh, consumer uh, film cameras. This one is from 1959, I believe. Um, I'll check my facts. Yes, 1959. Um, I can't seem to find the film for it either, so I don't think I'll be shooting this anymore. But it's really cool to have because it's a brand camera. Next, we've got this beauty, the Bell and Howell Zoomatic Director Series from the 1960s. It's a hand cranked 8mm sort of home movie film camera. It's actually really famous because in 1963, when JFK was assassinated, uh, some by the name of Zapruder shot his assassination using one of these actually. The 8mm film which goes into here, it's... I don't even know if you can buy it anymore, so I don't think I'll be shooting this either. But it's a very cool thing to have because it's the oldest um, video camera that I have. Interestingly, there's um, three settings for this when you run it. There's the run, which is normal speed. And then there's what's called animation, which is essentially it's cranking the frame one by one to create a stop motion animation. And then there's what's called slow motion, which is actually the camera cranking at high speed, at high speed because that runs the frames faster and records more motion in that time frame. And I picked that up for a few bucks at one house as well. And then there are these two um, film SLRs that I picked up from Filling Hots, Filling Hots as well either for free or for a few bucks. You've got the uh, Nikon FM and the Konica Auto Reflex TC from 72 and 76 respectively. Uh, these are the typical 35mm film cameras that you see nowadays. You buy the cheaper film but it's super expensive nowadays to develop them. There were some other SLRs that I picked up from Lone as well on the cheap including I think a Nikon F series and some other brand I don't remember. But I gave those away to one of the few film um, enthusiasts that I've ever met in my life. Shout out to you. Hope you're still shooting. I imagine that actually if I still worked at Rolling Hearts and volunteered every Saturday, I would have another whole box of cameras. Then there's this, which is the Canon A1. This is actually my dad's. It was produced in 1976. I've shot actually quite a few shots on this. I just haven't developed the film. It's in my bag full of film. Yeah, I have a camera bag just full of undeveloped film. Some of it's from the cameras that I picked up at Rolling Hearts actually, so I might find some interesting shots from other people. This next one is the Polaroid 600 Wind Step, um, an iconic name in photography. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I present to you the certificate for officially having lived under a rock your whole life, and that's backwards, okay. I might actually be able to shoot this in the coming years um, thanks to the Impossible Project, which is a project that has brought back Polaroid film Polaroid more or less collapsed in its film department um, about a decade ago because people weren't really, weren't really shooting Polaroids anymore. They all went to digital. I actually had to cheat on the sound effect for this camera because I don't have access to a film cartridge. Now what's interesting is that the film cartridge, which you slide to this place um, right here on the cameras, it has the, um, the batteries in there, um, electrical contacts which power the rest of the camera. Interestingly, this is the second um, Polaroid 600 that I found from Roy Hearts. The other one I think I also gave away. I'm not quite sure what happened to that one. This is one of the later Polaroids I've ever built. Uh, the 600 was first introduced in 1983, I believe it was. Polaroid one step anyways. So this one could have been built any time between 1983 and 1990, 1999, 1998. Now this one has an interesting story. This is a uh, Minolta Maxim 70. It's the only um, digital film camera they own. What that means is that it's actually got a computer in here and processor that can do automatic, automatic focusing, automatic exposure. And what's interesting about it is that in the bag that came with, I found this. Probably can't read that, but it says Macy's Parade 1994. Press balloon areas only. So essentially, whoever this camera belonged to, they were a photojournalist at one point. I also picked it up from Rolling Hearts and that was from 1985, I believe. And now we're following on to the um, CMOS and CCD sensor digital cameras. The uh, point and shoots. Here are two of Kodak's um, earlier point and shoots. Kodak was really slow actually into getting the digital age. That's what sort of killed it. These two are Kodak Easy Share cameras. This one is the DX7630, and this one is the LS443. This one I picked up from Long Hearts last year. It was released in 2002, so this is older than this one actually. This is from 2004, and this is my, ca my family's camera. I use it for family vacations. Um, 
you know, visits back to Taiwan. And I actually used this for my very first photojournalist assignment. It was of a, of a high school basketball game. I looked really awkward on the sidelines using this thing. Now we move on to the cameras that I purchased with all my own money. The uh, Mega Blitz Metz 44 AF AC Flash. It's the first um, flash that I owned. Um, I used it for uh, two years, I want to say. It was only for 80 bucks on sale at this place called Unique Photo in a few towns over from me. I used it up until last fall when I was shooting a school event at USC and accidentally dropped it uh, one final time and the hot shoe adapter snapped. So it doesn't really mount on any cameras anymore. But I can still use it for an off camera flash. So the first camera that I actually bought was this the Canon PowerShot SX20IS. It's what's called a super telephoto point and shoot. This was from 2000 and. 2001, 2000, 2009, the fall of 2009, I bought this one because I was just about to shoot a Molde video for my chemistry class. I was also just appointed the photography editor for my high school newspaper. So I figured I shouldn't be shooting with this anymore when I'm the editor for a newspaper. And I got this thing, uh, which is really handy, you know, the zoom and all, I can shoot sports even from a far distance. I got some mileage out of this, but then a year later, I had other photographers coming to me saying, hey, why are you shooting in JPEG? Why are you shooting in RAW? And they look at my camera and like, oh, that's not a DSLR, that's just a telephoto uh, super zoom. So a year later, after working a whole summer as a golf caddy, I got about a thousand bucks and I spent it on a Canon. 550D that was $400 more than this camera actually. Yeah, I would recommend nowadays don't make the jump from point and shoot to uh, super telephoto point and shoot because these things basically cost, they cost a bit cheaper than DSLRs, yes, but if you're thinking more farther than shooting stuff like this, get a DSLR. So actually the next camera I can't show you because it's filming right now was the Canon 60D. It was released actually a few months after the 550D. But I bought this one refurbished, so it only cost me about $500. The reason why I upgraded was because it shoots a bit faster. It's got a faster uh, frames per second shoot. And it can shoot at 1 8,000th of a second, which helped me achieve this shot, which is of a lighter going off. And plus it's got this flip out screen, which helps filming, you know, talking to the camera. And finally, there is this Yongnuo YN555EX flash. I bought this one to replace my broken uh, METS flash. And I like this one a lot more because it's got this um, diffuser, which comes with it, and the, and the bounce card on top of it, which you just pull out, or you try to pick that, and a swivel head. And I can also use it as a, a slave flash, meaning I can sort of put it off to the side, and when I fire my main camera flash, this will fire as well. It's basically a cheaper knockoff version of the Canon 585, no, 580EX2. It works pretty well. The only thing I don't like about it is that it can't sync up to high speed sync. If you, you have done flash photography, you don't know what I'm talking about, and where the uh, consequences come with that. Oh, and of course, the iPhone 4S. I got this last last month um, after replacing my iPhone 4, which I had since, what was it, the fall of 2010. This is the workhorse for publishing most photos that publish nowadays, just because I don't have as much time to sort of go into artsy projects with my DSLRs. And that's it. Like and subscribe. It'd be much appreciated. Uh, if you want to say anything, you can message me or leave a comment below. Uh, my name is Joseph Chen, and thank you for watching.